Hi, I'm Dr. Clay Carmichael, clinical psychologist, author of Nervous Energy, and your host of the High Functioning Hotspot. Today's guest is very special. His name is Kyle Kaiser. He is a 23-year-old NHL National Hockey League player. He's in his fourth season, I think, at this point. So he's actually been pro for quite a while. So we have a really interesting conversation about mental control, um, the difference between confidence and humility, how he manages all those things, because he's not only an amazing hockey player, he's also a really amazing person. And I think you'll see that as you watch this interview. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much Beautiful. for joining me, Kyle. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, yes. Just to provide a little context for like how this all came about. I sure. actually got a notification on Instagram that this, you know, NHL player was posting about my book, um, which I thought was interesting because I don't know if people always think of NHL players, you know, as, as reading these types of books. So if you don't mind sharing, I would love to know how you came across it and uh, what prompted you to read it. Sure. Um, I personally actually was, uh, I was in Wisconsin visiting my brother. He goes to the University of Madison. He's getting his PhD right now. He was off at work. My dad and I were, you know, looking for things to do. So we went by Barnes and Nobles and we were taking a peek around the books and, you know, something I have struggled with for a little bit is my anxiety. So I wanted to find a new book that I could use um, to maybe learn some new tools, especially with my season coming around the corner. Um, so we were at Barnes and Noble and I was taking a look at the different books and I happened to come across your book, um, did a little reading of, you know, just a few pages and, you know, looking at some of the techniques that you had mentioned. Um, and I loved it. I like, I was like, okay, this is something that, you know, I can fe feel that would be beneficial to me. Um, so I picked it up. Like I said, I started reading a little bit and, you know, it was pretty easy decision from there. I knew that I wanted that book and I grabbed it and been reading it ever since and I've loved you know the techniques and the experiences that you've shared in the book about different people and and you know it's it's a lot of the things that I can relate to as a high functioning individual and um you know thought it was great great material and some of the stuff that I've already techniques I've already applied to my everyday life well that is so amazing thank you very much for sharing that and I mean I just I'm curious it's such a kind of a new thing you're obviously a young person um mm -hmm. so but i think you 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 may be old enough to to know that it's kind of a new thing for professional athletes to just say what you just said to say like mm -hmm. hey i've had struggles with anxiety and i'm just curious is that how how has that been for you or how does it feel to to share about it because as a psychologist of course i think it's wonderful that somebody mm -hmm. like you that a lot of people see as a role model can share about that but what's that been like for you it's been a it's been a really i think at first when i finally started to understand my anxiety um it was difficult at first to kind of you know be open and express it because i didn't feel like people were going to understand what i was going through or you know what i was feeling um so it was difficult at first but at the same time like you said you know, trying to be a role model for, you know, younger kids or, you know, people that aren't comfortable being vulnerable about it. Um, I think from my perspective, I feel that if I can share and be, you know, courageous enough to talk about what I'm feeling with, and I've already had experiences where people have been able and felt comfortable to reach out to me about what they're feeling based on what I've talked about, about how I have gone through different things and what I've handled. Um, you know, it's been pretty enlightening in that sense to be able to you know, talk with other people. And, you know, when people reach out to me with their experiences, although we're talking about what they're going through, a lot of the stuff actually ends up helping me as well, because I get to hear about other people's experiences, what they're going through and how it relates back to what, you know, I've been through and, you know, what I've found has helped me, you know, might be able to help these people as well and vice versa. What they have, you know, found might help them can also help me as well. Um, so being able to be expressed, you know, express those feelings and be open about the conversation, I think has been really important for me. For a while, I found that, you know, I was kind of holding some things in and I didn't feel comfortable, you know, expressing those things. And, you know, it became a matter of time and, you know, conversation with different people, 
that I'm that I'm very close to and that I trust a lot that I've also gone through the same things and have you know kind of helped me to you know make that next step in expressing myself um, was really important for me and I feel like it's made a world of a difference um, from my mental health in that state. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, in a, in a way, of course, I'm not surprised at all because part of the whole premise of the book is that anxiety is actually a healthy thing that's present in a lot of people that have an edge, you know, it doesn't Mm -hmm. even have to always be about, you know, a mental illness or a disorder, not to stigmatize that. And I think it's Mm -hmm. great for people who are, you know, destigmatizing that. But I just think it's also important to understand, you know, that just like not all body fat is about obesity, not Mm -hmm. all anxiety is necessarily in the context of anything, you know, of any health challenges either, that there's actually Mm -hmm. a really positive, healthy function to anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. Now you as an athlete, obviously know a lot about how to channel that anxiety into Mm -hmm. constructive action. And so a question I have for you is everybody says, you know, if you make a mistake on the field, you know, everybody says to just put it behind you and keep looking ahead, just thinking about the next move. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, one, is that true for you? And if it is, how exactly do you, you do that when you're in this like super high stakes situation? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So for me personally, I'm a goalie. So, you know, there's a there's a high emphasis on our position. You know, we're the last line of defense in, in hockey as it is. So, you know, one mistake as a goalie and, you know, it's in the back of your net or it's a goal for the other team. So you really have to be sharp mentally in that sense of being able to let things go, you know, being able to reset your mind. And as you were talking about, if you make a mistake on the field or ice or wherever it may be, you know, being able to drop that for me personally, you know, there's a, there's a few techniques that I really have loved to use. Um, I was actually listening to a podcast, the Huberman lab. um, And so I was really, really into that for a while. And I was listening to it actually on the way to one of my games one time because I was feeling anxious about my game. You know, I was, I was nervous, obviously I get, you know, pregame butterflies or whatever, but for today of all days, I was really anxious about the game. I knew we were playing a good team. I knew it was going to be a tough game and we were in high stakes situation. And, you know, one of the things that I learned on that podcast that I use every day today still is, you know, I take two short breaths in through my nose and then just a little four second exhale kind of gets me back to a neutral base and keeps me in the present of where I am. Um, Cause it is hard. Like you said, when you make a mistake in your job, if whether it be on the field and for, you know, for sports, it relates to me, it's easy to get caught up in that because you're thinking about that. Ooh, I made a mistake. I let my team down. You know, I know I could have done better there, but at the same time, you have to keep moving forward. You know, life keeps moving forward and you have to make sure that you're right there with it. You're not lagging behind in that sense. Um, so those little cues, you know, for me, I'm just going to relate it back to my position um, and what I do. So for a good cue for me is that whenever I give up a goal, I just say out loud to myself, next shot. Mm. So I'm keeping myself in the present of, okay, that went, that went in, you know, I, I obviously made a mistake, but the next one's coming and I don't want that to happen again. So let's stay in the stay in the present in this sense and focus on the next shot. So it would be as simple as, like I said, those two quick inhales, a nice four second exhale and then next shot. So that way I'm staying and keeping my brain in the present at that moment, rather than letting what happened in the past kind of linger on. Yeah. I really like both of those and I have to check out the Huberman lab podcast. I've heard so many great things about it. Um, and the, the breathing one, obviously, uh, I like mm-hmm. that too, cause it's behavioral. Same thing with the next shot one. I'm just curious, did you come mm-hmm. up with the next shot thing yourself or did someone tell you that? So I worked with a sports psychologist. His name is Dr. Saul Miller. He lives out in Vancouver. It was actually someone that was recommended to me by my agent. And I had a couple of people that had used them before. Um, so we started talking about different things and I was telling him, you know, sometimes I just feel like I don't have it. You know, I'm, I'm lagging behind. I just, you know, I just know that something's off or I'm, I just know that my brain's running wild and his, we came up with a technique that I think has worked well for me. I've used it for the past, I want to say five or six years. 
And, and it was that next shot. And it all it was, was focusing on keeping me in my present state of mind of where I was at during the game and not, and even, even in the sense of, you know, not just looking in the past, but looking in the future as well. You know what I mean? When you're playing a hockey game, you're like, okay, what's going to happen in the next five minutes? You know, it's kind of in your book, the zone out of control. I don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. That's nothing I can control. So I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to worry about what's in front of me right now. Although when you, you know, you're high, when you're thinking, you know, you're in a game, you're, you know, there's a lot of pressure. You want to kind of dictate the situation as it is, because that way you have the most control out over it. However, that's, that's not possible. And especially in my position as a goalie, the play comes to me. I can't force anything. I'm more or less reading and reacting on what is happening in front of me and taking those visual cues. So for me to try to control what's going to happen is, is, is impossible. So using my brain and my mental power to focus on what's going to happen is just not, it's not productive in that sense. That makes so much sense. Yes. Now, I mean, hearing you talk about, you know, your agent and obviously, mm-hmm. you know, you're very successful already, but again, you know, you're, you're so young and mm-hmm. I do think that there's an interesting thing when it comes to, you know, looking at high functioning people and successful people and, and looking at their path. Um, so mm-hmm. if you don't mind sharing, I have a sure. few questions, for example, um, one is how old are you? And mm-hmm. do you think that there was anything in your childhood that kind of primed you for this? And then one more to just kind of roll in there is mm-hmm. when did you start to realize that you really did have what it takes to go pro? Because a lot of little mm-hmm. kids, you know, like it's a dream, mm-hmm. but when and how do you think that you separated yourself from the herd? So, yeah, I'm 23 years old. Um, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is not very popular for hockey. If anyone knows much about, you know, big down there is football, baseball, you know, the outdoor sports. So hockey was not a popular sport down there. So making it pro from Florida is not generally a normal thing in hockey. I'll I'll put it that way. Um, I think early on in my childhood, it was kind of, you know, very more, more or less the way I was raised. Um, with the family that I have, you know, my mom and my dad are extremely hardworking people, extremely disciplined. Um, my brother's the same way, as I mentioned before, he's getting his PhD at Wisconsin right now. So um, I think it's more or less the standard that I kind of held myself to since an early, early age. Um, and I loved hockey, you know, it's something I knew I wanted to do. I knew that from an early age, it was, you know, I loved doing it. I knew I was good, but I knew it also, it was going to require a lot of discipline. And, you know, this was something that was just, I guess, instilled in me at a young age that I knew what I needed to do, you know, following my, the footsteps of my parents and my brother and, you know, seeing how they went about their business in everyday life, um, whether it be my brother in school, you know, my dad owns his own company. Um, so basically being around that environment and realizing that, you know, it takes a lot of work to get to a certain spot, um, you know, was, was pretty eye opening for me, but going back to your question, when did I know that I would turn pro? I on it, you, you never know, honestly, even from an early age, the thing with me is, I think this relates back to what I was telling you about staying in the present. You know, when you start to think about the future too much, you know, you start to get caught up in that. But when I'm staying in the present and working on those things on an everyday basis, I know I have a good foundation of what I know I can play professional hockey from an early age. I knew that I had the, you know, the work ethic, the tools, the drive, you know, the commitment and the discipline to do those things. You know, now it was just more or less following a path of that sense. Okay. Now I like to dig into specifics because- sure. There's a lot of people listening who are parents or who want to be parents, including me. Mm -hmm. I am a parent. Um, And, you know, you talk about how your parents gave you that discipline or taught Mm -hmm. you that discipline or modeled it for you. Um, Can you, because I, I, I think that the tension that a lot of parents feel is that we, we want to do that. We want to have high expectations for our kids and everything. Um, Mm -hmm. At the same time, we don't want to overdo it. Um, But to be honest, my belief is that in general, like if anything, parents today are probably skewing on the side of 
maybe needing to provide a little bit more structure, a little bit more discipline and have mm-hmm. higher expectations for their kids. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a big fan of that just personally, but can you share any examples of like anything from your childhood where you learned or saw like really what discipline is? Yeah. So, I mean, my dad, for instance, his, his business, he runs an air ambulance business and that is a 24 hour business, seven days a week for anyone that needs medically equipped, you know, transportation. So for him, like just seeing him working, maybe at three in the morning, he's in the, you know, getting a phone call and seeing what he's doing 24 hours a day to provide my brother and I with what we need to be, to be successful. I guess I, from an early age, whether it was just me recognizing that, you know, my parents are doing all of this to, you know, to give me the best opportunity to succeed and that I need to, you know, also help out in that sense and capitalize on that opportunity of, you know, getting that, um, you know, I wanted to be that, like the, to, to show them that I wanted to be following their footsteps. I knew that that's what I wanted. And to go back to your point, I know that parents sometimes find it maybe, you know, they don't want to push their kids too hard or they don't want to, you know, you don't want to be the overbearing parent where, you're, where you're, your child is, you know, oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. And I think what the, the big thing with my parents is they had a very good balance of that. You know, the, what they expected, if, if you're in school, you're going to give your 100%. And that is, that is, there's no less than that. You know, we expect that. If you try your hardest and you fail, that's okay. At least we know that you gave your all and that you're doing the right things. That was the same thing for hockey as well. You know, if you're giving all your effort and your time and you're doing it to the best of your ability, we will be there to support you every step of the way. We will never force you to do anything that you don't want to do or if you're not enjoying it. But if you're into something, we want to support you um, as much as we possibly can. And then the rest is on you to make that decision whether you want to pursue that or not. Yeah, that's such a great balance. I I really Mm -hmm. like that. Um, So it it kind of leads into my next question, but I Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's, it's maybe a little different. So um, how do you find the difference between staying humble and really pumping yourself up and getting yourself up into like that think big, like type of Mm -hmm. a headspace? But at the same time, like you managed to stay very, very grounded. So how do you do that? Yeah, I think that there's so much, especially in the life of pro hockey, there's so much change. There's so much variability. Things are always, you know, there's so many highs. There's so many lows. You know, you're playing really good hockey for a month and you're on top of the world. Wow, I can't, you know, I'm the best right now. This is, this is as, better, as good as I can do. And then you go through a slump, right? Where you're struggling. Nothing seems to be going right. Nothing seems to be going right. I'm trying everything. I'm doing the same thing I was doing a month ago. It's just not happening for me right now. And I think keeping your head in a space of, you know, more of like a, you know, flat line rather than a too high, too low is so important for me, especially as a goalie, because our emotional, the emotion, the emotional part of goaltending honestly can make or break um, a person in that sense, because it is such a high pressure position. It's like a pitcher in baseball. You know, everyone's eyes are on you. You have the control, like you are the last line of defense, you know? So I think just keeping that more or less calm, steady mental state through everything, you're going to have highs and lows, but making sure it's not this way. And it's more or less just little highs and lows, you know what I mean? And more or less on that straight line of a, just a calm, kind of uh cool collected um and that's that's the biggest thing for goaltending as well they say you know for us as professional athletes the best professional athletes are calm cool and collected right you see tom brady or um any of these athletes in two minutes left in the fourth quarter with a super bowl on the line and they feel like you look at their face and they look like they're calm as can be and that's all about keeping it right here and the emotional and i think that can apply to everyday life as well you know what I mean? Keeping your emotions in check, not getting too high, too low, whether it be in a relationship, financial wise, doesn't matter. Just staying even keeled and just more or less. I think when I found that I could keep it even keeled, I found more success, you know, overall. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. That's a, that's such an insightful answer. Um, I was also curious, um, you know, we've talked about a few topics that in a certain way may relate on this, but Mm -hmm. um, do you mind sharing uh, if you were raised with or have now 
um, any type of religious or spiritual perspective that helps you? Yeah, so I personally was not raised with or raised with any religious or spiritual, um, you know, in that sense. Um, so for me, you know, my parents, um, you know, basically, you know, as much as you know, religion and, and spirit and all that stuff is a part of my life, it wasn't the emphasis of what I grew up on. I would say. Um, so for me, I think I just found that. I figured things out kind of as life went along. I moved away from home when I was 15 years old. So I moved up to, you know, Michigan. I played here in Michigan with my, or I lived here in Michigan with my mom for a year. I moved from South Florida. So I met completely new friends. And then at 16 years old, I moved to Canada to play hockey in a completely different country. I, was, I wasn't living with my parents anymore at 16 years old. So I think, you know, although I didn't have those anchors to kind of, you know, help me out through life. I had other things that kind of helped me mature in that sense and kind of understand how things work. Very interesting. Okay. So you're touching mm -hmm. on a couple of things. Um, mm -hmm. Now, as you know, I'm a psychologist, so I tend to mm -hmm. ask, you know, personal questions. And if sure. I ask anything you don't want to answer, that's fine. We can just cut it out. It's no big deal. But no so with what you just shared, it makes mm -hmm. me have two questions because um, sure. I've read that before about you where you talked a little bit about, you know, going to Michigan or, you know, different times mm -hmm. with your mom. And it made me curious, like, did your parents divorce? Because yeah. some people, and I, I thought that might be the case. And mm -hmm. some people, you know, whose parents divorce, um, you know, it's like they can be 30 years old and they're still talking about like how their parents divorce, you know, mm -hmm wrecked them and you know they're kind of sometimes blaming adult behavior even like mm -hmm. on this thing that happened and so mm -hmm. one question is um how do you think that you obviously dealt with that you know in a mm -hmm. way that didn't hold you back in life mm -hmm. and then the second question since you also mentioned being on your own as a teenage athlete uh i can only imagine alcohol <laughs> party hard <laughs> Um, sure. a, lot, a lot of high functioning people have a work hard, play hard mentality, mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm just curious if you can also share like how you find or found, you know, the, the sweet spot of how to have fun with alcohol, but also still not let it get in the way of being a professional athlete. Sure. Well, I'll answer your first question. So yeah, my parents, um, they separated when I was about five years old, um, Although my parents separated, I'm very fortunate in the sense that my parents were great together. They worked fantastic, even though they were divorced for my brother and I, um, you know, anything that my brother and I wanted to do, they were both there supporting us. They had no issues. So um, I was very fortunate in that sense. I know not everyone can, uh, you know, attest to that, but, you know, I was fortunate in the sense that my parents, you know, put the, you know, the goals of my brother and I ahead of their, you know, whatever they were dealing with at the time and, you know, made it the emphasis of, okay, maybe we're not going to be together, but we're not going to let that impact, you know, Spencer and Kyle's lives in that sense. We're going to work together to make sure that they feel comfortable, you know, around us together and that there's no issues. And, you know, and, it, and it's been that way my entire life since they divorced. They've, you know, they've always been very good together, working together. And it's really made it a lot easier for me and my brother, I can say. Um, you know, it's not something that we've ever had to worry about. We know we both have two supportive, loving parents that, you know, can be around each other and you know and that makes the world of a difference in the support sense you know i want both my parents to be at my hockey games you know i don't want one to come to one game and then the other one come to another game you know so and like i said i'm fortunate in that sense because i also realize that that's not the same for everyone um so i think that's been that actually helped quite a bit you know through my childhood of being able to just focus on what i needed to focus on whether it be school or hockey and not having to worry about um, maybe those, you know, family issues outside of those things. So uh, for me, that was honestly amazing um, in that sense of being able to just more or less keep a tunnel focus on what I needed to worry about and not having those external factors kind of play a role in it. Um, and going back to, and to your second question about, you know, yeah, you're 17 or I was 16 years old when I moved to Canada and the drinking age there is 19 years old. And, you know, you're starting to your junior hockey player in Canada, which in Canada at that age is a big deal. Like you're, you know, it's fun. And, but I think, like you said, there, there needs to be a balance of playing, you know, working hard, but also having fun as well. You know, I found that 
early on when I was, you know, younger, I was only work, 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 work. And it got to be exhausting. It got to be tiring. And I was kind of getting into that almost like a burnout phase of that sense. Um, but I think also when you do go have fun, you realize that you can have fun to a certain extent, but there are goals that you are trying to reach at the end of the day. And the goals of my, that I'm trying to reach aren't drinking and have, you know, partying and all that stuff. They're playing in the NHL. So, you know, as good as it, and it's great to have that, you know, mental, physical release, you know, you go out, you have a few drinks with your friends and, you know, you're able to kind of decompress and relax and, you know, because so much of our lives are just, you know, work and, you know, you know, family and, you know, you're, there's stress from every different a- avenue of your life. And to be able to kind of manage that was a learning experience. You know, you have to, you, maybe you have one night where you're like, Oh, no, nope, that was, you know, pushed a little too hard there or, you know, and then you start to kind of understand where and when you can't do things and how much you can and can't and what works and what doesn't with what you're trying to, you know, it's all about seeing what fits into your plan and your vision of your goals and how you can incorporate that to a moderate and respectful amount without overdoing it. That's great. I really like what you said there about how you gave yourself room to have certain occasions where you said, Oh, you know, we'll see. I pushed a little bit too hard there. Um, because that's one of the things that really helps people to grow is when they can be honest with themselves about, you know, areas that they want to improve, but then also have enough compassion and not like nail themselves to the wall about it to the point where it becomes hard to even recognize or admit that there was something to improve. So Mm -hmm. that sounds like such a, such a good balance now. Yes. Also for you going there and being, you know, um, a teenager, but yet also, as you said, very high profile in Canada, especially with hockey, Mm -hmm. um, couple of questions about that. Cause I've seen your interviews and, you know, you're so great and so natural on camera. So I was curious, a couple of questions. Um, Mm -hmm. when did you have media training and, you know, like (laughs) at what age and then number two, when the media asks you if, if you feel ready for something, because that's one of the things that they ask mm-hmm. you, and I've seen in your interviews, like, so do you feel ready? I'm like, yeah. does he feel like he can tell the truth? What's he going to say? Like, no, I don't feel like, <laughs> How, what's that like? So I've never had media training personally, but I think just watching, um, you know, older guys that I've been around that maybe I've played with and seeing how they handle situations and how they handle the media, you kind of pick up on cues of like, okay, this is what you can and can't say. This is what you should stay along these lines of, you know, and I think to the sense of there's some guys that are very, you know, by the book, this is what your answer should be. And, you know, as much as I try to, you know, stay on those lines, I also want to be able to kind of express, you know, my personality a little bit and, you know, be open about things and not just, almost be reading off of a a media paper in that sense of like, Hey, this is what you're supposed to say. Yes. I know what I'm supposed to say, but at the same time, I also have opinions and feelings of my own too, that I would like to express because it shows who I am. And I think that's a big thing for me. And yeah, like if they ask me, for instance, like the question you brought up, do you feel ready for this situation? Well, maybe I don't, but at the time, I have to, you know, put out that persona, but also at the same time, going back to kind of how your brain tricks yourself as you're saying these things. Yeah, I feel ready for it. I put in the work. I've done the things I need to do. You know, you start kind of thinking, yeah, I have, you know what I actually I have, I am ready for this. You know, this is something I'm ready to do. And, you know, you start to say it out loud and you start to actually genuinely gain that belief inside yourself that, yeah, I'm ready for this. I can do this. You know, maybe you in the deep down, you really don't feel ready for it. But at the same time, you know, if you know that you've put in the work, work and the right steps to do the right things, then you know that you're giving yourself the best chance to succeed. And if it doesn't work out after that, then it doesn't. But at least you know that you're putting yourself in the right position to do the best that you possibly can. Yeah. Like at the very least, you know, that you're, you're ready to go train and you know, that that's what needs to happen. Um, so High functioning people, as I know we have just a few minutes left, so I'm starting sure. to kind of like think about like what's mm-hmm. next. High functioning people, you know, they they tend to think ahead and have goals. So a couple mm-hmm. of questions kind of around that front. Um, one is, you know, if you could write your own ticket, what would be your five-year, you know, plan in, in your life? And then the mm-hmm. second one, again, this is personal, but I, I can't help mm-hmm. it. 
um, because my other book was about dating and I really am Mm -hmm. interested in, you know, just what I think is such a, an important part of life oftentimes for high functioning people is, is to Mm -hmm. have a good relationship. So I'm curious if you tend to date, um, I, I'm presuming women, but if that's not mm-hmm. true, let me know. But that do you tend to date uh, women who are very athletic as well? And since you are so focused and mature for your age, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, what kinds of things do you look for when when you're dating? Um, and then again, yeah. just in general, like what's kind of in your five years, if you could write the ticket? Yeah, so I'll start with the dating um, aspect. I think as an athlete, um, yes, you, I think you're drawn towards other athletes naturally because you see almost society yourself in them as well, because you, they understand kind of the competitive nature, the discipline that it takes to get to a certain spot or whatnot. But I wouldn't say that I completely, um, only go for athletes in that sense. I think more or less what I'm looking for is just someone that's smart, intelligent, you know, compassionate, open-minded, um, but also has goals. You know, and I think that's really important for me is that the person that I'm with, I want them to have goals. I want them to be, you know, chasing something like I am as well, because then I think that's important. You know, you're pushing each other. You're, you know, you're helping each other out. Okay. You know, she's trying to do this. I'm trying to do this. And we're going to, you know, both use our, you know, our abilities to help each other and push each other to the goal. Um, so I would say when I come, when it comes to dating in that sense, I look more in that um, kind of area of, you know, I want someone to be, you know, like I said, driven, you know, I want them to be, you know, disciplined as well and kind of share the same values that I do um, in that sense. So, and then for my five-year plan, you know, I would like to sign a nice big deal where I'm making lots of millions of dollars. I don't think that sounds too bad, but um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for me in a five-year plan, like I said, um, That is amazing. Obviously, I would love to have that. But in a realistic sense, I just want to, you know, one of the things that I've tried to always focus on, and I know this kind of sounds corny or cliche, is I just want to keep improving every year, whether it be, you know, from a professional standpoint or from a personal standpoint. You know, as long as I'm getting better every single year in in both of those categories, um, you know, professionally and and personally, then I'm pretty happy with where I'm at in my life. Um, you know, in that sense, (laughs) yeah, in in that sense, for sure. And I know I have a ton of growing to do. Um, you know, I can say, you know, from when I was 20 years old to 23, I I can tell you I've grown a ton. You know, when I was 20 years old, I had no idea what anxiety was, or even if it had any impact, you know, I thought at first when I I heard about anxiety, I was like, oh, this is just something people, you know, they can figure it out or whatever like that. And, you know, you're kind of naive at that young age. And then you start to go through, you know, some of these things and you start to gain an understanding of what people are actually going through and under and feeling, and it changes your perspective on things. Um, You know, that's something that I had to understand and I had to learn. Um, And that's why I try to really be more compassionate with other people in the sense of, you know, being more patient and understanding that, you know, let's not be so quick to jump to conclusions. I think, you know, in today's day and age, a lot of people are quick to jump on other people for things. And, you know, like we really don't understand what other people are going through behind the scenes. And I, you know, have had that happen to me firsthand, you know, where I, you know, my first year, and I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I'll just touch on this for a second. Um, My first year of professional hockey, I had a really bad concussion and I didn't play hockey for about nine months. Um, I saw a bunch of different specialists, um, you know, it was something that I was really struggling with. I was waking up every day, very lightheaded, um, very anxious. You know, I was literally, I would go to bed thinking like, how are my symptoms today? Like whatever. And then waking up the next morning and immediately thinking like, oh, do I feel better today? Because concussions are one of those things where, you know, it's, it's over time. There's no medication. There's no, Hey, this is a 68 week process it really varies depending on the person and how long the recovery time is. So for me, you know, I get in the first week and I'm like, okay, it's only been a week. It'll, it'll take some time. You know, now we're getting into five, six months of me waking up every day. And the only thing on my mind is when am I going to get better? Am I going to ever feel better again? And now you're starting to overthink things, you know, and now it's becoming a spiral effect. And that's really when I started after that year, of handling that is really when I started to get into, you know, reading about anxiety, doing meditation, focusing on things like that, in that sense, you know, it was also a situation where, you know, 
And like I said, this was only my personal experience. So I don't, you know, other people I know are completely different. I was, you know, my doctor was talking about maybe, maybe we prescribe you medication. For me personally, I did not want that. That was my personal choice. I'm fine. I think it's a great thing. I think it can help other people and I'm all for it. However, I wanted to try and do something that I can figure out, you know, if I can do this in a natural process without having to rely on something. So that was my opinion. And I started to do that. I started to read. I started to meditate through the yoga, um, you know, and start to understand my body and my mind a little bit more. And it's been, you know, I think I've made a really big strides in the past three years in that sense. And I'm still looking to continue to do that. You know what I mean? There's a lot of days where I do wake up and I feel super anxious. And I'm like, oh my God, I just can't shake this right now. I'm thinking about my games in, the, in the, this week. And I know we have tough opponents and, you know, I know I didn't play well last weekend and now you're, you know, it's starting to compile and you have to just take a second and just, you know, relax. Okay. Let's, you know, let's think about this. What can we control in this situation? Okay. Let's prepare really well all week. That way we give ourselves the best chance to be successful at the end of the weekend. So just about learning and managing and, you know, it's something that I think I've done at maybe a little bit younger age than most people. I think most people start to understand and learn that at a, at a later age. But I also think that was just more or less a product of how, you know, my environment and kind of being on my own at a younger age and kind of, you know, maybe figuring things out a little bit quicker. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, a lot of people are um, on their own at a younger age and it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily lead to them like figuring things out and being on a right. good path. So I hope you give yourself credit for that. Um, and yes. I really like the way that you're using anxiety there constructively that you found mm-hmm. yourself, you know, kind of ruminating and saying to yourself, okay, well, I feel this anxious energy. I'm just ruminating with it. I'm not doing anything constructive. Mm-hmm what could this anxiety be stimulating me to do, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. doing some meditation, maybe doing some yoga, doing some Mm -hmm. things that will actually help to assuage the source of my anxiety. So um, that's a beautiful, beautiful note to end on probably. Go ahead. Actually, the the reason I picked up your nervous energy book out of all, because I saw the cover and it said nervous energy. And that's a lot of the times what I feel before a hockey game is very nervous energy. You know, you're excited, you're anxious, you're ready to go. But at the same time, sometimes you don't know how to put that energy in the right spot. So you end up figuring, you know, you end up letting that kind of control your emotions rather than helping it aid you in that sense. And that's why I really picked up your book was because I was like, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I feel before games. I'm nervous. You know, I'm anxious. I'm excited. It's all these emotions and, you know, feelings and adrenaline rush coming through my body. How can I get myself to a state where I can use that, you know, anxious and nervous energy into a positive? So thank you for that. Absolutely. (laughs) That is the goal. Yes, that is the goal. Yeah. So thank you, Kyle. And um, I'm definitely going to continue following you on Instagram. I I enjoy checking out your feed. I'll make sure I'll put links to you know your social media below and Beautiful. you know any other links that you may want to share about awesome. Kyle we'll put them in the links awesome thank you so much it was a pleasure I love I've never really got to talk about this so this is honestly very exciting for me in that sense because it's something I've really been trying over the past two or three years since I've had that concussion to kind of open up about and have more of a conversation about. And I think it's important, you know, especially in, you know, sports itself, there's a big stigma around male athletes, you know, talking about their mental health and, you know, what's bothering them in that sense. And I don't think that that's fair um, in that sense. And I'm not saying it's a specific person that's saying that they can or not. I just think that we don't feel exactly comfortable that we, we feel it's a sign of weakness in that sense. And, you know, I think more or less me trying to express myself has been more of a, hey, this isn't a, a sign of weakness. This is, you know, this is normal for most people or not most people, but a lot of people. And let's work together to fix this rather than, you know, letting this compound and become something that it shouldn't. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if, as time goes on, if you have any other, you know, thoughts or, you know, stories you mm-hmm. want to share, or points you want to make, um, just always feel free to let me know and we'll have you back on to share you know, anything you want to share on your journey. Okay. I would love to. Yeah. We, maybe we'll do something. Uh, my season starts here in October. So anytime during the winter, if we want to talk during the season, maybe I can give some uh, personal experiences about what's been going on through the she- season, different games and how I used to your book or the tools to calm that myself before certain games and stuff. I would love that. That would be fabulous. That'd be great. Thanks Absolutely. again, Kyle. Take Thank care. Thank you so much. It's a Bye. pleasure.
Thank you so much for listening to my interview with Kyle Kaiser of the NHL. And as promised, there should be some links handy if you wanted to catch up with Kyle on social media or with me on social media to learn more about my you know, books or articles or anything like that. And if you ever do want to suggest a guest, by the way, for the High Functioning Hotspot, please do feel free to go to my website and, you know, suggest somebody. There's contact forms on the website. My website is drchloe, drchloe.com. I know that can be a little hard for some people, drchloe. Um, it's just hard to remember sometimes of exactly how you spell it. So you can also go to anxietyishealthy.com. That's anxietyishealthy.com. And that will just take you to my website as well. So thanks so much again for connecting here through this interview. And I hope we can stay in touch till the next episode.